Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming, and uh, welcome at the 10th event of the Public Occasion Agency. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask you to uh, switch your mobile phones off. And uh, before I introduce tonight's speakers, speaker, I just want to say a small word about the Public Occasion Agency. Um, the Public Occasion Agency, or the POA, has been established <laughs> as a self-determining framework for a public program here at the AA. We are an agency, a practice that serves other practices. We do so by staging cultural and intellectual uh, transactions in the form of events. As part of the POA's institutional enterprise, each event is uh, accompanied by uh, two paper publications, a preview and a review. Um, uh, for the review, we commission somebody that is now actually in the audience. These documents together form the ongoing archive of the POA, um, which you can find in the AA bookshop. Um, for this term, we have three other events uh, planned. This Thursday, uh, so the day after tomorrow, we have Kai van Hasselt, who will speak uh, about the role of externalities in the city. Then next week, on the 25th, we'll have the super studio of graphic design um, from Holland, which is Metahaven. They will talk about their work and specifically in relation to their new book, Uncorporate Identity. Then the last term, last event of this term uh, will be with Arnold Reindorp, a Dutch sociologist, on the 30th of November, uh, who will explore the city as a performance. Tonight, we are very happy to introduce to you Noor Piriferini. Noor is an Italian national educated at the London School of Economics. He has 10 years of professional experience accumulated between Italy and the UK. He is an economist, e economist and a financial analyst in an international banks. After working shortly for Lehman Brothers in Italy, he worked for the Italian government from 2002 to 2005 in the privatization process. Based in London, Noor has worked as an energy and commodities specialist since October 2005. His professional interests also focus on entrepreneurship and venture capital by helping early stage companies find investors. He has been a junior fellow at the Aspen Institute and worked as a non-profit partner for the Robert F. Kennedy Memorial. So we basically met Noor uh, during the opening week of the Biennale uh, in Venice last August, at the where he was a speaker at um, the Beyond Entropy um, Symposium organized by Stefano Raboli. Noor did a short presentation on the issue of commodities, um, which convinced us that it could be a fruitful thing to um, uh, have Noor expand on this in a kind of more elaborate version of this back here in London. So tonight's lecture will address several of the main issues concerning the interaction between commodities and, environment and environmental markets. Please join me in welcoming to the AA, Noor Piriferini. Can you hear me? Is it on the speakers? Yes, I am. OK, thank you, Jan Malta, the navigator, <laughs> for the wonderful introduction. I'm um, very pleased to be here. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, AA, future architects of the AA, and other fellow guests and students. Uh, again, I'm very humbled by this invitation. And, um, and um, I, I look forward to, to this lecture today. Um, I think that, first of all, speaking in one of the temples of architecture and planning is a unique opportunity for, for a guy like me, and also for a cross-border debate on, and interaction on themes of common interest. Today, we will talk about the links between commodities, the environment, and the future of cities. My name, as uh, Jan has already said, is Noor Puripurini. I have worked here in London long enough uh, to have some experience on how markets have worked so far. And, and it is this experience in the commodities environmental sector and, uh, and uh, the, what I've seen lately in the evolution of uh, cities that I would like to share with you today. Um, London is uh, by far one of the most interesting observatories in terms of markets and economics in the world today. Uh, it is on a part of New York, uh, Hong Kong, and, 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 and Sao Paulo. 
one of the most um, challenging trends I've been um, able to observe during the past, uh, past five years has to do with our basic precious but now limited natural resources in all possible contexts. And I think that by opening our eyes and accepting to go beyond our comfort zone, we may realize that by 2040, 60% of the world's population will gravitate around huge megalopolises. Cities are increasingly becoming centers of deployment of capital, labor, and corporate growth. In parallel with this increasing economic and financial interdependence that has been shown also during the latest crisis in 2007, 2008, and 2009, uh, given by the globalization and sp speculation, means that the interdependence between cities and financial markets, places like London and York, may translate into uh, other events somewhere else in our hemisphere, like food riots in, in, in Africa. Um, so it is true, at the same time, that if this happens, uh, we, we are seeing a global push towards total urbanization, because urban centers represent a unique opportunity for uh, people, and a sort of hope for people to to achieve higher standards of living. How will we face, you know, confront the, th the themes today? Well, the first, the first point I'd like to share with you is why commodity markets have influenced civilization and industrialization in the past 200 years especially, and how they will influence us all in the future. The second point is the creation of environmental markets uh, as a response to uh, the problem of pollution. Um, we will go through them, uh, try to be as quick as, as, quick as possible, and, and try to understand uh, why, uh, sh since we price everything, uh, natural capital should be uh, you know, uh, a, a concept inserted in our uh, calculations of uh, uh, whether it's uh, uh, buildings and, uh, uh, and other things in our economic and financial equations. The links with urbanization will come as a third point in the consumption of resources, material, and energy. Um, it is staggering uh, to see the links between what is happening in the commodity markets and material markets in terms of how, what we took for granted, that, that the, the, the materials of construction and the basic materials we use and input uh, to, 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 to build cities and, 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 and buildings are uh, born to be influenced by uh, material inflation. Um, so it will not be my task today to enlighten you on the specific problems in planning, designing, budgeting, and incorporating principle for making better cities or ma making them uh, smarter. But I would like to draw your attention upon and consider you these economic planners. And uh, just to show you that economists, urban planners, thinkers, and citizens will have to, to gather together and, and, and probably master uh, some uh, um, network responses to the problems that we are facing today. Um, let's start with why commodities? Well, we all know uh, that commodities are the basic materials of our life. Um, we, are, we have crude oil, refined oil, oil products, zinc, copper, aluminum, lead, thin, nickel, precious metals, and soft commodities, so-called coffee, sugar, cocoa, grains, rice, vegetable oils, pulse, uh, nuts, uh, spices. Uh, these, these markets make up most of our material world, and they all are, uh, some way, uh, you know, traded in global markets. They are uh, priced and they are basic inputs to our uh, production uh, pattern. If we look at this slide, we see that uh, commodity booms have to do with uh, our basic, um, with industrial cycles, and, 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 and historically, we have, we have seen bouts of inflation uh, coming up, especially in the periods where there were uh, geographical instabilities or inflation, uh, periods of significant infrastructure investments, investments um, other, other factors that have come in and played a role 
um, in, in, for example, in the 1970s, remember, remember the oil shock that uh, has uh, created a huge uh, spout in inflation, and or uh, the last five years from 2003 to 2008, which were led main, mainly by uh, the, 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 the rise of China and other, and other developing economies into, into play. Um, on top of um, our dealing or the way the financial world deals with the commodity markets, uh, we are going through a period of uh, economic reassessment and of our standards of living and how we have to deal how on with how the huge growth of debt following the crisis in, in, in industrialized economies um, today will impact us all. So following the, 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 the 2008 crisis, we're starting to have a new debt crisis. And we have the Greek debt crisis, uh, the coming Irish public debt meltdown, and possibly others to follow. This will impose a massive transfer international intergenerational debt on our shoulders. And we must become entrepreneurs and smart thinkers since we will not be able to rely on friends and family that much. In the current cities, global markets model, the regulated markets play a fundamental role since they determine prices and speculate where they can. Right now, I am um, quoting Saskia Sassen. You probably know Professor Saskia Sassen from uh, her publications, and you come across uh, possibly many of them uh, on the role of cities as financial and economic centers of control. Um, so the, my argument is also that cities' global markets determine supply, demand, and prices. Cities' global markets determine policies. Can you say the cities' global markets are solving environmental issues with the same efficiency? Um, let me just go through again why we are talking about this from a commodity perspective. Before the collapse in, in, in 2008, high energy prices fed inflation globally, where high fuel prices nearly stopped vehicles from circulating and made transpor transportation globally prohibitive. After the horrific 2008, deep down into 2010, in 10, the same effects on resource markets seemed to re replicate the dynamic of 2008, and prices of energy, food, and materials are rising again to worrying levels. So there is also, um, the, the lecture the, in Venice was focused on the f uh, food markets. I decided to try and make a link with the environment in cities this time, because uh, there is a staggering link between the instability of prices in the commodity markets and what can happen in the way we use materials in the future. Let me just go through the various, the various slides and also let us uh, also go through the, the latest trends on the various, on the various markets. Uh, one of the reasons why commodity prices rise has to do with, our, with investors' appetite. Uh, investors usually invest in bonds and equities, but this appetite is going away from the sector and also pushed by global uh, issuance of new liquidity. We are seeing a rebound in, 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 in commodity investments and an estimated amount of 300 billion of, uh, uh, of, of investments invested into commodities or contracts related to commodities or financial products related to commodities. Uh, the other reason behind, um, behind um, the spout in prices, for example, here we're looking at uh, oil, and you could well see the peak it reached in 2008, $150 incredible fall in 2009, well into 2009, and let's say how the price is recuperating, and also at the worrying levels again, because we're talking about $90 per barrel. Uh, what is going on in this world? Well, apart from investors' appetite, of course, there's industrialization. Food, um, commodities are generally, along with energy, metals, and food have fed historically industrialization processes since the colonial era. You may remember Spain, Portugal, from South America, the relationship between France and Africa, colonial relationship, England and Asia, 
Holland and in Indonesia, and which have created the wealth of city historically. So merchant cities have always been central to global development and technological evolution. And today, the global cities are continuing to exercise this control function. Uh, another factor uh, which is important to bear in mind is, of course, energy and materials uh, are our input prices in whatever we do. Petrol, diesel, cost of land, seeds, fertilizers, all prices of both energy and nitrogen derived from natural gas. For example, nitrogens are used to, to harvest, uh, to plant seeds have structurally gone upwards since 2004. So to summarize, we may see here uh, all returning to the worrying levels uh, in 2010 compared to 2008. We see gold structurally gone upwards from 2006 uh, onwards to, to levels we've never seen before, well beyond uh, $1,000. Uh, $1, uh, Copper. Uh, copper is one of those crazy materials that we never think about, but we have a very high per capita consumption of copper, uh, let's say 10 times higher in Europe than in China and the USA. And at the peak time in 2008, $9,000 per ton was the price. Today, we are talking about, uh, again, uh, a price of 9000 So it really structurally went upwards again. and. Uh, and it's one of those uh, products and materials we have to watch closely because the price could even, gone, could even go higher since uh, copper reserves are very limited. Um, the same happens to food. And uh, you may have uh, come across one of the many publications that have been uh, recently um, around. Uh, there has been a 100 pages published by the uh, Financial Times and uh, on the problem of food. Uh, food prices are going up. Uh, structurally since I would say as from the graph you can see from 2006 onwards and this is partially due to uh, dietary needs that are changing in the developing markets and speculation spouts which are due to lack of regulation in this market so I would I would call this a trend and this speculation again here we see a spout of speculation um, Let's go forward. Let's summarize um, what, what has been going on in, a, in, a, in a commodity markets and what's the, the worrying factors. Let's say that from 2003 onwards, uh, structural factors have affected the, economy, uh, the, the commodity markets along with uh, speculation. Let's say that uh, financial actors, uh, not only banks, but financial intermediaries, have uh, taken over the structural fundamentals that were changing which are due to demographics, growth from uh, China, Brazil, India, and African countries, and bet on rises. This produces uh, two separate areas. One which is the physical markets, and the other one is the financial markets. Financial markets have increasingly, uh, increasingly influenced the price formation of, uh, of uh, our commodities. And although the trading of commodities is one of the oldest existing businesses, today, uh, thanks to you know, this increasing participation, a lack of regulation, it is possible to influence prices uh, very much. As a proof of this, you, could, you can well see uh, what happened uh, in terms of financial investments. Financial investments into commodity sectors have, uh, well, have boomed since 2003, where you had you know, basic context, uh, contracts where uh, you insure your prices. Normally, producers in insure their prices by buying protection, price protection. And this time, banks have been allowed to flow into these markets to basically put positions, conquer uh, larger and larger contract pools, and make bets over them. So we are talking about a natural futures, the famous future contract markets of a size of, uh, of uh, you know, naturally around uh, the half a billion, one billion, going up to six billion in, 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 uh, in 2005, over eight billion in 2007, and reaching the top of a 14 trillion, sorry, 
14,000 billion, 14 trillion in 2008. So these are due to structural loophole, and, uh, and this is uh, what has happened and what has influenced our uh, inflation, uh, the price of the products, why the, the food is so expensive in London. <laughs> you ever uh, ask yourself uh, why the um, price of meat? Well, you know, this is due to, to structural changes uh, around the globe and, and speculation on, on prices. Uh, why did I, did I want to, to, to make the connection between commodities and materials? Because I found that these bloody commodities are actually affecting uh, uh, also our uh, precious materials. And um, so as you can see on the left column, there's uh, you know, typical commodities that will participate into a construction process. And the second column where materials and energy relationship is explained, or not explained, well just shown, uh, with a what a difference. We are uh, looking at percentages, which I based on, on, a, uh, on a textbook, which I found, which is the engineering materials by Cambridge University Press, where I wanted to see how much weight commodities could have in terms of uh, material prices. Well, in the case of iron and steel, of course, you know, skyscrapers, 27% is a uh, typical 30%, uh, one third of the cost is due to iron and steel. Uh, wood and lumber, depending, you know, more related to the housing market, uh, is up to, uh, could be 21% of the overall cost structure. Copper, 13%, uh, plastic, 10%, silver and platinum, much less, and then going down, as you can see. Well, this, of course, uh, you know, brings, brings bring, bring us to impose a reflection on what we're going to do with these markets if they're going to cost too much in the future. And especially as architects, engineers, designers, and economists, what sort of efficiency standards do we want to establish uh, to make our buildings, uh, well, you know, efficient, uh, less costly, and maybe less boasting, more intelligent, more clever. So I, th I think that the future factors may be related to Price and availability, recyclability, the environmental impact, assessment, physical density, the weight. Can we make uh, things in a lighter way? Is this possible? Conductivity. Can we make things that uh, bring energy in a more efficient way? Thermal uh, issues. Uh, as you know, uh, British houses, but not only British houses, I'm just mentioning the houses here in London are not well insulated, as you will have realized. Uh, maybe network houses for an to achieve uh, smart grids and uh, energy efficiency? Will houses, buildings for that matter, be energy exporters rather than importers? And will we stop paying bills uh, to utilities if we manage to work out? Why is this important? Because, of course, our consumption pa patterns are, in the long term, not sustainable. Uh, if we look at this, you know, uh, could be very simple graph, but with, there is some science behind it. The number of planets that we would need if all humans consumed per capita as much as the following nations, <laughs> you can see it for yourself, you know. We would need five planets if we consumed uh, like the US, 3.5 like in the UK, 2.7 in Italy, and uh, well, for the moment, just for the moment, uh, half a planet in India, but this is just because uh, um, India is growing slower than China, for example. Okay, this so much for part one. I just wanted to, to, to underline the problem of, uh, of, um, of commodities and, and their consumption and their uh, inflationary pressures uh, that will result in the future due to the global competition over resources, over materials, over food. Uh, what does that have to do with, uh, with this graph, for example? This graph, um, uh, uh, I want to establish a bridge with the environment uh, because, uh, as you can see, this, apart from the, the, the trend which is not sustainable, there isn't em enough material for everybody to consume and use whether in, in, in consumption processes or in construction processes, there are, there are huge problems with pollution. Um, and energy consumption across the world is projected to continue accelerating. 
especially as large emerging markets develop rapidly and are forecasted to have the highest economic growth levels. China is growing 10%, India more or less the same levels. And uh, we must realize that the burning and the consumption of, of, of these processes, which are well represented here, uh, for example, the burning of energy represents 80% of the greenhouse gas emissions in, in the atmosphere. So, of course, then there is some methane, which is thin, which, which is due to the burning of uh, other, uh, um, uh, other industrial processes such as agriculture, and then a very bad, a very bad nitrous oxide, which is, which is even worse than any other uh, greenhouse uh, gas, because it has to do with the ozone layer. Um, so, where does pollution come from? As we said, 77% from greenhouse gases, methane, and nitrous oxide. Buildings emit approximately 40% of CO2. Industrial processes, such as refining of oil and metals, 4.3% of carbon emissions. Land usage and deforestation, 12.2% uh, of the total. Agriculture, 138 and waste, 3.2%. What, well, through the 90s, what happened? Uh, so we have a problem with pollution too, not just with the consumption of commodities, not just with the inflation uh, impact of commodities. We have a problem with our own atmosphere and the result of 200 years of industrial uh, development. Well, through the 90s, industrialized nations realized that th this no return scenario of temperature increases, devised, uh, so they devised the so-called Kyoto Agreement which will be sometime in the future replaced with a new stricter agreement. You may remember the Cop Copenhagen failure in 2009, um, which always will be linked to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So the next meeting will be Cancun, and the nations will convene together. The major feature of uh, the Kyoto Protocol, Kyoto Pro is not a, a restaurant, is a, a it's a city uh, where the, the industrial nations convene, as you all know, uh, but many people don't. And um, they set binding targets for 37 industrialized countries and the European community uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. China and USA together account for nearly 50% of global CO2 from fossil fuels. And as the world's biggest polluters, you would expect them to take a lead on this, 50%. Uh, of the global annual uh, pollution, and they don't. They don't participate to the Kyoto Agreement, and they don't have official cap-and-trade uh, mechanisms. So let's introduce the concept of what, how to reduce, how to reduce this, this um, amount of pollution which is in the atmosphere. Um, one way of, that everybody, economists have argued is, um, one way would be taxing. But the right way, according to many others, and I agree with, with it too, would be to find the right market mechanism which would allow uh, to give a price to pollution. We give a price to plastic, we have a price for every material that we, that we buy. Uh, everything is commoditized. Well, uh, as far as we are concerned, natural capital uh, is not uh, priced. Uh, many water streams or the impact of our consumption and, and polluting processes are, are, are not priced. So one way of, of starting doing this is to establish um, a cap and trade, which is you know, this market-based approach used to control pollution by providing economic incentives for achieving reduction in the emissions of pollutants. Uh, how does it work? Well, a central authority sets a limit or a cap on the amount of a pollutant that can be emitted. So you have, uh, for example, the European Trading Scheme, which has decided since 2005 to allocate national levels of, of emissions to main polluters, that is utilities that burn energy, and has decided that uh, th they would allocate for each nation uh, X amounts of uh, CO2 certificates, carbon certificates, 
that would be used uh, uh, to control pollution. If you go beyond your agreed level of emissions, you need to buy it from somebody else in the market that has been virtuous in reducing it. So as you can see, the trade happens where plant A reduced emissions to below the cap level and now has extra allowances to plant B, which was unable to reduce emissions and uh, maybe technology options for doing that are limited and expensive and perhaps in this case, a little bit pessimistic decades away from, 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 from being developed, especially in developing markets where the main energy option is coal. Um, yeah. In the, in a, in, could, could there be countries? Well, you, uh, not really, not really. Uh, it, it, it is not done through uh, deals through countries. It has, to be, it has to be done through a system where you, as a plant, are uh, assigned. Uh, up until now, you've been assigned as a utility X amounts. And, and um, through, especially, well, the only, the only uh, track record that we have is the European trading uh, scheme. The European trading scheme for cap and trade is the only thing that we have seen in this in this sector in the past five years, and for the moment it, is, uh, it has worked from a top-down approach whereby these allowances were distributed. And this has created several problems that we will discuss in terms of pricing, um, but this has to be uh, exchanged through industries mainly, and uh, there are no government and cities as such. Uh, involved in this, and this is one of the points that we will discuss because it is it is actually an issue uh, going forward. Um, so, as we were saying, the only uh, cap and trade system which exists so far, well, we have some some markets like the Chicago Climate Exchange, for example, that's created a some few years ago. The members of the Chicago Climate Exchange commit only 300 corporate members in America, and you imagine. Um, um, can uh, commit to reduce six percent of their um, um, well, commit to reduce by six percent their emissions. We have the EU ETS. Uh, we have Blue Next uh, in in another way somewhere else in Europe. We have the European Exchange uh, controlled by um, by uh, by ICE. We have some schemes in Australia. Um, but let's talk about, let's focus on the European, um, let me just focus on the European trading scheme. Uh, the European trading scheme started in 2005. The first uh, phase expired in 2007. Uh, it had covered all EU ETS emissions since January 2005. Uh, the second trading period with the new allowances started from 2007 and will finish in 2012. This experiment has allowed, um, has allowed more, many more participants and a growth in this market. Then we will talk about all these uh, you know, acronyms. Uh, the EU ETS contains ca several uh, different uh, uh, carbon credit schemes. Uh, the, the, the main one is uh, European Union Allowance. Uh, um, and as you can see, uh, the volume has, has grown considerab considerably from 2008 to 2009. And in terms of value, we see an increase from 335 billion market value in 2008 to 143. Uh, billion 2009. So, notwithstanding, notwithstanding the, the 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 crisis and the problems which are related to to this market, we, the, the we have seen uh, experienced growth. Uh, let me just define, for your benefit, uh, these acronyms. Uh, so, as we said, what we are trading from a, from polluter to polluter, or from virtuous non-polluter to a polluter, is carbon credits. Uh, uh, one carbon credit can be defined as EUA, and it's uh, an allowance uh, equivalent to one metric ton of CO2. 
um, the other uh, possibility, the other financial instrument, financial paper, apart from the EUA, is the CER, which is a, a unit of uh, one, one ton of uh, CO2, which is generated by the so-called CDM mechanism, which is a mechanism through which uh, developing countries can develop uh, cleaner energy options and, and, sell, uh, and sell carbon credits to raise financing. Because the mechanism is, you know, I have this project, uh, what is a solar park or what is a wind farm in, for example, Nigeria. Can you imagine the, how with the, the, the problems that Nigeria has today? But uh, maybe somewhere else in, uh, in, the, in the developing world, they can uh, rely on a, a X amount of CERs uh, to be sold on the market to raise additional financing. So this, for the first time, is the only market that has managed to create a price and a new commodity upon which you can raise financing to finance a project which, as a result, will emit less carbon. There are other examples. The, the Australian version of uh, CERs is called NSW. CCX, uh, as we said, is the members of Ch Ch Chicago uh, Climate Exchange. VRs is voluntary emissions reductions, and it's one of the options that, for example, cities have used so far uh, for, uh, for projects of uh, waste uh, and, uh, and recycling. Uh, let's see the market evolution. As you can see, um, prices have uh, been very much related to one factor. Let's remember that we are running on coal and gas mainly. One reason for in introducing, for introducing uh, CERs, this market giving a price to pollution, is to make uh, energy providers less dependent on, 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 on coal and more dependent on gas. So we're not even talking about uh, switching, uh, switching from, uh, from directly from coal to renewable or uh, to solar or to hydroelectric. We are talking about a way to limit uh, the amount of coal, which is 50% of global uh, energy uh, production is dependent on coal. So as you can see, uh, the, the, the prices uh, have gone up uh, accordingly with, with other commodities in, 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 in the period uh, that, that followed up to the crisis in 2008. And uh, since then, utilities, which were cash-strapped and had various financial difficulties, started selling CERs and EUAs. And, and uh, people started talking about also a failure of the market since to pollute, the cost of pollute was well below 10 uh, euro per ton of uh, carbon emission produced. Let's see how CERs are and, and, and EUAs, for example, are, are faring compared to other commodities in the market. And as you can see, the, uh, the, the carbon credit line uh, is not performing that well in the past five years. And whereas, uh, as you can see, the liquidity goes more, much more on oil, which is the white line, or gold, which is a substitute for liquidity. So if you, if you want, investors started liking a lot uh, more gold, oil, or even food, but still less uh, carbon. Why is this? Well, there are some successes to record, you know. According to available data, the reduction in CO2 emissions, that means pollution, uh, are a little bit vague. Uh, but uh, they say that from 50 million to 100 million tons of CO2 have been reduced. Power companies uh, have integrated this cost into their investment decisions. That is, they, uh, they decide their energy mix based also on this uh, market and how they can benefit from it to get financing. We have a price of carbon, which, as we said, you know, as was launched, was around 5 euro per ton. Went up to 33 euro per ton, and then went back down. And right now, it's trading at around 15 euro per ton. Uh, first new methodology tested in five years. And uh, new carbon trading schemes are being created internationally, Australia, maybe one day in America, if, uh, if, if uh, the conservatives um, which have regained majority in the Congress allow them to have, um, to have them. But beyond the political decisions, there are some voluntary schemes, for example, in California. Uh, the new cap-and-trade uh, cap um, law will be passed into, 
again, into a law, an official law, and California will have his own cap-and-trade system to reduce pollution. Um, what are the other problems uh, I have uh, seen? Well, <clears throat> of course, it's a small market. There is an unclear demand-supply relationship. Uh, initial allocations were based not on proper sound economic analysis of how the markets uh, work, and, uh, and they were sold for free at the beginning. In phase three, we will see a change. Uh, from 2012, uh, the EU will allocate through market auctions, and the target re reduction is much higher. It's 21%, 21% reduction in, in carbon emissions. Um, carbon markets are, again, not global, so therefore there, are a lot of, there is a lot of carbon which is not priced around the planet, and we are paying in terms of externalities, which will be the subject of the next lecture, so I'm not going to go into this. Um, another thing that will have to strike your eye is uh, the size of the trading market today is eight, 8 billion ton traded. It is worth what the CO2 being traded today versus 30 billion tons emitted in one year. You can see here uh, carbon emissions are being tracked by the main utilities and, 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 and other players. And uh, you can see uh, who has been uh, virtuous. Uh, companies like Tata Steel, also Mito, that have uh, forcefully uh, cleaned up their, their production processes. And so they've been uh, short. Uh, they have been long, let's say, long on carbon, whereas all the other utilities, such as RWE, that burns a lot of coal and Vattenfall in Germany, E.ON, AG, uh, well, you know, they had to buy a lot of um, uh, allowances in, in the market. <coughs> Let me try to wrap up. Well, of course, uh, looking at this slide, number 28, we see uh, that there is a problem. If we want to create CO2 markets, we need some government incentives and investments in uh, clean energy, which are there. You know, we're talking about 140 billion spent in 2009, 150 billion spent in 2010 in terms of creation of new uh, renewable capacity. But what we're looking at what we're looking at here is a value of 312 billion for incentives to the oil and gas industry. So it is more the money spent on protecting oil and gas industries around the planet than the money spent on new renewable projects uh, around the planet. This is the, a graph um, showing installed capacity and decommissioning of existing uh, plants. Uh, installed capacity reached 10,000 megawatts in, 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 in wind. We're talking about uh, 6,000 megawatts in natural gas, uh, solar 4.2, and uh, biomasses, of course, play a role, but are, they are dangerous to the environment because they consume things that we should eat instead of using for energy. Um, why? So let's come to theme three. Uh, why do I think that cities matter in, in all this mess? You know, global cities controlling commodity markets, global cities and cities controlling uh, emissions. Um, my feeling is that the EU and other financial institutions are using a top-down approach, allocation, um, having to face lobbying from industries. I think that there is a problem in terms of how these markets are created, and I think that cities can actually help in creating more functioning markets, since for various reasons, which I will list, cities uh, have to play a huge role in, in, in pollution. 50% of the world's population now li lives in cities, according to the World Bank. By 2050, three out of four people are expected to live in urban areas. Uh, urban areas currently use 67% of the world's energy and account for over 71% of global uh, greenhouse emissions. Um, 
cities in the developing world where most of the growth will take place can have a six significant po positive impact if we start devising uh, new policies in terms of how we want to reduce this amount of pollution. And uh, there are several suggestions in this sense, uh, but there is no proper scheme adapted to the way cities uh, are actually interacting with this. One reason is that uh, environmental markets are being designed for producers on the one hand and not for the consumers on the other hand. So you have a gap in terms of who is actually really responsible for, 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 for the pollution that is produced. Uh, but it's clear to everybody, and uh, there is enough literature and example to understand the CO2 reduction in cities can be possible and uh, through these various uh, points, material efficient design in the future, uh, less less material in the, build in the buildings as long as they can uh, stand on their feet, recycling, waste treatment, energy efficiency solutions, smart transportation, smart network cities through the use of uh, the internet and computers. Well, always keeping in mind artistic and open mind places that we want to be in and uh, keep some healthy anarchy too since nobody wants to live in a perfect, perfect, perfect place, right? Um, Again, green buildings could reduce energy use by between 25 and 50 percent, depending on where you are. CO2 emissions by 40 percent, water use by 40 percent, for example, and solid waste by 70 percent. I have uh, brought here uh, a few examples that I think are re relevant around the planet uh, in terms of what's going on, and I would like to show you uh, a couple of videos. Uh, in a few seconds. Uh, <coughs> is this actually possible? It is possible. There is a global deployment of uh, resources and, and design. Uh, there are different approaches to the problem of cities, a re reduction of resources, and especially impact of energy efficiency. Uh, there are examples like Mazda. You all probably heard about it in Abu Dhabi. It's a huge town. Uh, which is built as a technology hub for the Middle East. Uh, Fosters, I believe, are the uh, international architecture studio in charge, and they, uh, they are just projecting to build uh, the fabulous zero carbon emission, the first zero carbon emission, but in the middle of the desert. So you may wonder uh, who will want to live over there, you know, regardless of how many emissions they will produce. Uh, Wuxi is a nice example uh, of the Stantec headquarters, and we have a picture. There's a different uh, example also of Kalumborg, which is in, in Denmark, and they converted a whole industrial site which used to refine uh, oil products and, and, uh, and, and produce chemicals, from, uh, and, and they transformed it into a clean energy hub. Uh, Auroville in India is a town, a universal citizenship town based on uh, on the human values, and uh, there are some refugees from 1968 which have done a great <laughs> job in uh, doing, uh, building a 3,000 people community. There are experiments in, uh, going on in Brazil, Curitiba, in Amsterdam, in Stockholm, which are all target at uh, carbon emission reductions, and the are the RMI lead projects which are shown in, in the video. Is this possible, you know, gaining gaining uh, efficiency, of course. Uh, Adobe headquarters, after its lead uh, uh, retrofit, uh, achieved 35% reduction in electricity, 41% uh, reduction use of natural gas, 22% uh, uh, less water, uh, and, uh, and uh, also uh, a fantastic 94% uh, uh, reduction in solid waste. This is quite staggering, uh, is uh, the, the Santec headquarters, is the, the largest producers of uh, uh, films for solar panels in the world, and they managed to produce a building which is completely uh, energy self-sufficient by covering it with uh, uh, thin films. So it is, those uh, glasses are actually thin films and they produce all the energy that the, 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 the building needs. This is Auroville again. This is what Auroville will be one day. It's a galaxy with a, a temple at the core. Um, it's pretty, pretty uh, idealistic. 
uh, but it has uh, some sense. It is built in the middle of vegetation. It is for man to live uh, in, a co in cooperation and find uh, different uh, uh, mechanisms to help each other in a coordinated fashion. Uh, everything is produced in a sustainable way. And uh, they target to develop a city by 2020 and uh, increase their population by uh, tenfold. You know, from 3,000 they are today to up to 30,000 in the future. Uh, this is another experiment on the, on the lines of Masdar. It's uh, Songdo in South Korea. Uh, it's, a, it's a massive uh, collaboration between government uh, and uh, technology companies. And they are uh, pretty much uh, on, the, on, the, on the line of building a new city from scratch, which, which I find uh, interesting, but maybe problematic. OK, I've concluded, uh, I've concluded what I wanted to say, generally. And I'd like to show you five minutes of uh, a video. And then we can have a, a Q&A. place to begin. Now, a built environment is a huge consume of materials and energy. It's the very easiest place to begin because there is this codification of what is a green building. LEED is a very important tool in changing how we think about design and construction. And it requires the entire team, the owner, all the designers, and the contractor, to consider many things that we didn't consider prior to LEED. Depending upon which statistics you find most accurate, generally it's agreed that buildings consume somewhere between 40 and 48 percent of all global energy, roughly 40 percent of all virgin materials, but they also produce 40 percent of all CO2 on the planet and roughly 40 percent of all of our landfill waste in the country. When we think about high performance buildings, it's having a lower environmental impact uh, and it's good for our economy and it's creating a better place for the building users so it becomes sustainable in a variety of ways. 30 Hudson is a million and a half square foot building. We will have almost 6,000 employees over the next couple of years. This is an early LEED building. It was one of the largest LEED certified buildings in the world. We are an entrepreneurial firm so when we look at why go green it's got to make sense. It's got to make commercial sense. We incorporated LEED standards in all our capital projects operating procedures. With the building of our new headquarters, we will be the largest owner of LEED certified buildings. We have committed to reduce our carbon emissions by 7% by the year 2012. We believe a healthy environment is the foundation for a sustainable, strong economy. And that in itself is a business case for doing the right thing as it relates to the environment. Our whole company is focused on the fact that no longer can the environment and economic growth be at odds. And in fact, the only way to have economic growth is sustainable economic growth. And that business needs to take the lead. My grandfather started the business here in St. Louis in 1918. We have been ranked by Engineering News Record as the 55th largest contractor in the country. This used to be a metal fabrication plant. It was built in the 1950s, and now it houses our um, headquarters, our international headquarters. We reused as much of what we found here, but we paid special attention to the energy use, the recycling of the materials, the use of water, and other resources that are part of the building. 
and we tried to make it as friendly for the users as we could. Facilities such as this, there's an integrated approach. 20% of the year, here in the Midwest, we can run on natural ventilation, which means the windows open, we can turn off the HVAC system and run on free cooling mode. The thing that makes it high performance is that all of those subsystems are working together at peak efficiency in order for the building itself to be the most efficient it can. In this facility, 110,000 square feet, our utility costs are half of what they are in our old facility at 70,000 square feet. That's going to pay dividends for a long time because it's reduced the costs. But it has more dividends in how it's perceived by the people we do business with. It also sent a great message to our own employees. It isn't a matter of how much more is it going to cost. It's a matter of what's the best building I can get for the money that I have. It's a subtle difference, but it's an important one. We are right in the mid-range of what a Class A structure in St. Louis would cost. We call sustainability a leadership initiative. We don't call it an environmental initiative. We believe that the customer... all of it. I think it's time to go towards the conclusion and I wanted to share with you this one which is a provo provocative um, video. By uh, a group of designers in Finland, I believe. Scandinavian designers. have always proposed rationality and discipline to build better cities for people to live in rewind to Fourier and Ledoux town planning becomes a tool to design and change society through the idea of an ideal city Mr. Ebenezer Howard's theory of three magnets refuses to recognize benefits of neither town nor country relocating their positive aspects to a new border area the benign garden city aka suburbia you is for utopia you is for utopia you is for utopia you is for utopia Corbusier knows a city life it can't happen in the suburbs so the suburbs have to happen where city already exists the clarity of his vision the radiant city is the brilliant solution to heal the fester in metropolis by creation of tabula rasa instead the post-war need and greed sparks the big bang of suburbia la ville radius taken out of town to howard's garden city becomes the explosive blueprint for an entirely urban planet that sees all space as commodity and potential for further conquest yo this is a new utopia unlimited growth with new technology geodesic domes walking cities space odyssey 2001 you is for utopia you is for utopia you is for utopia you is for utopia disappointment of 68 oil crisis disillusionment utopia loses innocence as he starts dealing with the world overpopulation social problems environmental issues poverty i met with mass production standardization computerization mobility you is for utopia you is for utopia you is for utopia you is for utopia you left your mark on the city you couldn't purge it of its complexity the ideal diluted into reality just that greed and necessity the price is right uh, live out your fantasy city is consumer utopia if you work for a week you can shop for a weekend this is the equation we struggle to maintain See you.
made it to my lecture You find points towards now architecture System of the world, miracle of science Can fix your fixed reality, lambs anger the lions Me said, less is more Bob replied, less is a bore That was before, now we must progress And do more to impact less More nature, more city, more urban cause Build less sprawl, emit less carbon you More trees, public transport, tower stall No more diamond like Kano, it's a war Guess put the body anti-urban and schism Kick out of starting my wife, no room out of vision Land use distortion, big box prison Hit him with the power move, now urbanism Low to know, a brace for the blow This golden era and its status quo Low to know, and rework the flow Bend the curves, grow more slow Sticks and stones, loans and homes Maintain the balance, these skeleton bones A lyrical footprint, high and body jargon Flesh mostly made of water and carbon Anti-suburban, I club track composer Feel now how the future comes closer Cross over to the policy maker Eyes on the timeline, future forecast breaker I know you're angry I'm angry too Who took away my urban rights? I know you're angry I'm angry too You read the policy peer review More ambition please It's sites laconic You think to be polite Or just ironic Low to know A brace for the blow A this golden era And a status quo Low to know I reroute the flow Bend the curves Grow more slow We're fine with it We got the message right? So this is all Thank you very much for attending And uh, I'm sorry if it was A little bit longer than expected And um um, looking forward to your questions. And <laughs> Are there questions. questions from the room? Um, about the carbon credits economy, that, that's something that's been uh, discussed a lot in my country. And Where are you from? I'm from Brazil. Yeah, and I, uh, I'd say that I do not believe in the carbon credit economy. First of all, because uh, the the per the price of the, the the credits they depend on the demand, or meaning that if I believe that I should invest in carbon credits, that I believe that that uh, companies are not going to reduce their pollution, so they need the credits. So that's the why they would want to buy the credits. Yeah, no, I, I see your point. Obviously, it's very early to say. Uh, you can be skeptic uh, or uh, the problem is price, isn't it? Uh, I mean, there is a problem with price. I mean, the price that we see today, which has been between 5 and 15 euros per ton, is not the price that actually engages uh, utilities or any polluter in the world to actually make those changes. And there are other problems too. Of course, uh, how do you create the right demand for something like uh, pollution? But it's true that the mechanism itself, in a way, it rebalances uh, the amount of pollution in the market is clever. What is not clever today is how much am I penalized if I emit one ton of, of pollution in, into, into, into the system? Another thing is that in terms of how you relate to a market, Normally, when you talk about equities, bonds, or other financial paper, which is easily tradable, even commodities, you're talking about a global market with global consumers. Uh, obviously, uh, the markets, uh, the carbon markets today do not cover the globe, do not cover the, the, the spectrum, uh, the available spectrum of pollution. And obviously, the price does not reflect well uh, the impact that pollution has on, on, let's say, the natural capital. And... Uh, what the debate is today be on financial between financial analysts uh, regularly is whether not much whether this is a market that cannot exist is whether you know it has existed it has resisted how can we improve it and one the first point is uh, how can we achieve higher prices obviously higher prices can be achieved uh, in, in several ways. One is creating more demand, so having global markets. Uh, another way could be through incentives, but this needs to be discussed. What kind of incentives? Is it a market uh, that receives uh, money from the government to decide over the, the, the price of uh, the allowance? I mean, there are many questions. To me, the right price is between 50 euro per ton and 100 euro per ton. Because in that case, that means that the carbon change the carbon pollution that a, a company needs to, to, to face uh, is, you know, the carbon price is huge. 
but at the same time, it doesn't have to be too high, because otherwise people, as it is happening in America, they're threatening to, to put people out of work if they put a price on carbon, because they say it will cost us too much to change production patterns of energy or of manufacturing. So uh, you either let us pollute or we will make uh, people redundant. So we have to find the right balance, but the prices have to go up, and companies can bear the price. But if I had the utopian belief that all companies would uh, someday in years or maybe centuries uh, diminish pollution in order to, for it to have a sustainable world, let's say, then, I, then the carbon credit market would disappear because no one wa needs to buy carbon credits no, if no one's polluting more than, than they should. So actually, I, I don't believe that the problem is in, on the price of the carbon credit. I believe the solution is not in market, it's in regulation and international regulation. But re re I, it's, a, it's a fair point. It's a fair point, I understand it, and actually the audience needs to think about this, whether well, regulation is uh, uh, the, 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 only, the only way. Well, obviously, regulation has never been the way, because uh, the reason why you are probably standing here at the AA is not thanks to regulation or government help, or maybe you are on the ground, uh, but maybe also because you work or uh, because you have enough m money to, to basically uh, to basically access a commodity, which is your uh, AA degree. Uh, and, and the same is for pollution. Uh, I mean, things work better uh, under a market mechanism just because you create, although it takes time, a demand uh, and a supply of it. And, uh, and it, it only takes, uh, it takes time. I, I, I sincerely hope uh, that this market will grow because it is a flexible mechanism and it's a gradual and it's a gradual solution for companies to switch to better, better uh, electricity mix than they do today. Okay. <laughs> Regulation is not enough. One, one way is like taxation. Uh, well, taxation will just push uh, companies to produce and, uh, and emit and pollute uh, somewhere else. It won't solve the problem. So it has to be a combination of different factors. Uh, the, the problem, the one, uh, may I continue or anyone want to, I don't want to monopolize you. No, no, no. But, uh, for example, if the carbon credit market would become like international, uh, instead of uh, poor countries industrializing themselves, which is a path to, for development, uh, it, it's, it's a, a hard path. And uh, in the short run, it would be easier just to sell my pollution rights to, to companies in the U.S. who are polluting like 50% of the world instead of they reducing their pollution. Yes, absolutely, but it's better to have a market that actually contributes to a reduction than not to have one. It is yeah. not the perfect solution. Yeah, I see. But yeah. at least it, it, it begins a process. And, uh, and we will see. Uh, many developing countries don't want to pay the cost of, of, uh, of uh, renewable sources and uh, governments and especially us who made uh, the, the, the pollution what it is today, which is 450 billion uh, threshold, uh, 450 billion tons of CO2, uh, which is a sort of a no point return in terms of uh, climate change and environmental impact. But in terms of, it, in terms of energy mix, I, I think that the carbon markets give you another option and that previously we didn't have one. But do you believe that the market may... Maybe there's uh, somebody else who wants okay. to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we can continue this. Yeah, thank you for your very inspiring speech and um, very deep knowledge base. Uh, you mentioned the taxes. Um, I think it's very instructive. You have a look at uh, the German word for taxes is steuern. That's related to, to govern. And uh, I think um, maybe there is a, a mistake in, in, this, in the structure of uh, the idea. Uh, in general, I think the pollution comes from the consumption. And uh, Bravo. In, in our now societies, we have taxes not on the consumption, but on uh, employment. Exactly. Uh, this is and a huge problem. It in the way it is a, uh, let me just pick from what you said. It's very right. Uh, one way is uh, consumption, but not just said as consumption as, w as citizens, what we do every day, which is very important. But in terms of, uh, of, of communities, obviously, uh, the way communities interact with pollution for the moment is outside the market. We can access as cities 
uh, or as projects, uh, voluntary schemes by applying to the United Nations. And these schemes, uh, which is the CDM, you know, if you're a CDM project, you can access some financing uh, based on your expected uh, uh, emissions reduction. But uh, we are counting at a global level on only 150 projects, 150 projects which are related to cities, emissions reduction. And they all have to do with waste, uh, with waste. So we're not talking about new buildings, new quarters as entities. So it's a federalist, what, I'm, what I try to bridge here, whether the way carbon markets today work, it's not efficient because we are not creating the right demand. But what if a more federalist uh, system whereby cities, which are the biggest emitters of, of pollution ca could access these markets much more fluently in an efficient way and, and actually participate in creating larger amounts of carbon uh, priced, for example. And uh, I think it's a win-win situation. Uh, but this is uh, still not on the cards. We're still talking about auctioning to big companies. Uh, are there more urgent questions? Especially if you see here. Going back to what you said, uh, you know, EU ETS is the combination of uh, uh, EUAs and uh, what is called here primary CDM is the amount of projects that per year you have seen, you know, authorization. And right now there are only 404 projects. Uh, in, in sorry, yeah. Yeah, for a value of 6.5 billion in 2008 and 211 projects. So also the development carbon market is very much related on the availability of financing. Obviously, if you don't have financing for your project, you can't emit uh, your carbon credits. And so it really is dependent, like the house market or many other markets, on the amount of leverage you can, uh, you can get to finance your activity or your construction. But at least I would say that the no novelty of this, that at least you have a new asset from scratch, you could have a new asset which will partly finance your project, whereas before you just had the loan financing and the money of the investors into it. Whereas today, if you s show that this will have X am amount of people, X efficiencies in terms of energy, and this will mean translated into X amount of CERs being emitted, well, you're doing, uh, you're doing uh, something completely new and you are creating the demand for, for uh, CERs and EUAs, for allowances. And um, yeah. Hi, good evening. My question is relating to the carbon credit markets as such and the functioning. Uh, does it only, uh, do the carbon credits exist only as exchange traded credits or let's say I have an environmentally friendly forest land can I actually produce carbon credits and sell it off to companies to offset that so demands? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Your name is? My name is Shreyas. Okay. Um, well, you know, the, the basically, uh, there are various, of course, this is a, a complete new area. Uh, as we, s we said before, I mentioned that the fact that natural capital itself is not priced into, into the equation. So it's very hard to give a price uh, to forest, to a forest, for example, and uh, the amount uh, per acre that a forest contributes to the reduction of global uh, of global pollution of uh, carbon by by photosynthesis. This uh, the, the American government, for example, is trying to uh, through various institutions. And I was talking, I was talking the other day to a guy called uh, Lou Munden, who is uh, the chairman of this Lou Munden project, and they specifically advise the American government on how to incorporate uh, into the market, apart from the, uh, let's say, corporate-driven uh, uh, CERs, EUAs, or CDMs through projects in environmental, in, in, in developmental world, how to incorporate natural capital into the CER market. But we are very far, uh, we are very far from establishing uh, rules for this. Calculations are very difficult. And uh, he said personally to me, uh, I think that rather than letting forests uh, have their own uh, uh, X amount of CERs and giving them a value, uh, we should rather establish ways through and regulation. So again, in, uh, in, this, in this case, 
uh, your name again? Alex. Alex, you are right. For example, at the moment, we don't have the right methodologies to price in forest into this global car carbon market. And it, it, again, it was saying that maybe the best way was if, you know, to put a price on whatever forest reduction uh, you were going to meet. So you are swapping, let's say, uh, with the government uh, the fact that you may uh, or may not uh, uh, reduce the, the amount of forest land. If you do, you will be taxed. So this is a better way, for example, to, to look at the way to incorporate forest or other natural capital into, into this. But for example, again, there is another problem. Uh, we're thinking about something very new again, because the way, uh, for example, we don't have a global price for type of uh, pollution in terms of, you know, when, when uh, uh, an aluminum smelter dumps uh, uh, X tons of, 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 of chemicals into the Danube, uh, is there uh, an international rule for the, um, to measure the amount of dump in the river and how much you're going to pay for that? I mean, there is a precedent. Right now, BP has, will be paying $40 billion for the millions of barrels of oil. Nobody knows how much they are, but they're probably in excess of 10 uh, millions of barrels of oil. So, so we are you know, in new, new land. We need to explore uh, methodologies, mathematics, and uh, of course, this poses also ethical questions in terms of will everything have a price in the future? Uh, unless there are um, like super urgent questions, I would propose that we continue the conversation in the bar. Um, Good. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. Um, thank and thank you, you Noor, for oh, your thank very you. coherent and revealing presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.